Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election season is well underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot this year and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for re-election due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and a new wave of leadership for the city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, several new borough presidents, and many new city council members. And that's not all that's on the ballot. A number of incumbents are eligible for and seeking re-election, including the city's public advocate, and there's a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan District Attorney. In this episode, we're focused on the race for Manhattan Borough President. Party primaries are set for June and the general election will culminate on November 2nd. This is the first full set of municipal elections that will feature both early voting and the new ranked choice voting system, which applies only to party primaries and special elections. We'll have a separate show just on ranked choice voting to break that down. The city election cycle would be of enormous importance under more usual circumstances, but it's unfolding at a time of great crisis for our city, raising the stakes of the decisions that you, the voter, will make. The new wave of city leadership will quite clearly make or break the city's recovery from the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its many impacts on health, families, jobs, education, housing, and much, much more. It's also important to note that the city faced a number of significant crises even before the pandemic, and some of those have only gotten worse. So it's an important time of choosing here in New York City, and we're pleased to bring you this series of interviews with candidates running for citywide and borough-wide offices, and there will be debates down the road. These one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you to get to know the candidates better, learn about their backgrounds, their platforms, where they stand on key issues, and their vision for the future of the city and the position they're hoping to hold. We hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make informed decisions when it is time to vote. So today we're focused on the position of Manhattan Borough President, a borough-wide office with several core responsibilities around land use, community boards, capital funding allocations, and more. But it's also a key role as a planner, an ombudsperson, a cheerleader, and a representative of the borough. The borough president appoints community board members and convenes community board leaders, while also acting as a convener in other ways, issuing reports, making other appointments, including to community education councils. The borough president has a bully pulpit, which can be what the office holder makes of it, and an especially important voice on land use matters. So we'll talk about that and much more in these interviews. So joining me now by Zoom is Elizabeth Caputo, a Democratic candidate for Manhattan Borough President. Elizabeth, thanks for being with me. Thanks for your time today, Ben. It's great to see you. So tell uh, voters, tell viewers a little bit about yourself before we get into your campaign for borough president. Uh, who are you? Where do you come from? What have you done? Sure. Thanks so much for your time. And, and thanks to all the organizations who have helped put this together. Uh, look, I, uh, I have lived and worked in Manhattan for 25 years, my entire adult life. Uh, I'm running because I believe that our city and our borough need qualified new leadership to move Manhattan forward. Uh, I grew up uh, actually in the Midwest. Uh, I am the daughter of public school educators uh, and I grew up there. Uh, I got into college um, in the East. I like to say a, a college that says it's in Boston, but I went to Harvard College. I then went to Harvard Business School. I have lived in uh, Manhattan since 1995. Uh, I have lived in basically the same neighborhood throughout those 25 plus years. Uh, I have been very active in a number of different organizations. Uh, most importantly for this job, I chaired Manhattan Community Board 7 as the longest serving community board chair uh, in its history uh, for three consecutive terms where I was reelected every time. Uh, and also chaired a major civic group where I helped elect a lot of local and national candidates over the years, which is very dear to my heart as an organizer democratic leadership for the 21st century. I did that all while holding a full-time job, um, which I continue to hold to this day. I'm working full-time and I believe uh, I'm the only candidate who is actually working full-time uh, while running um, in a non-government job. 
And I'm really excited to talk about that a little bit more about the importance of working uh, people and especially working women uh, in this race. But for my one constant uh, has always been Manhattan uh, throughout a lot of different changes in jobs, uh, in apartments, in relationships. My neighborhood has always been the Upper West Side and has been Manhattan. And I'm really excited to talk to you more throughout the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes about all we can do to make a Manhattan that is safer, cleaner, greener, and more equitable for everyone. Safer, cleaner, greener, and more equitable. All right, we'll, we'll try to get to get to all of those. But um, before we do, how do you capture for people why this position is important? I gave a little bit of the overview, obviously, of some of the powers and some of the the hard powers, the soft powers, um, but how do you capture for people why a borough president's an important position and why you want it? Sure, I mean, I can hit on the three points you mentioned, which I think are all really, really important for this job. Uh, I lived here during 9-11. Um, I was working here during 9-11. Um, and what I remember, one of the things I remember most vividly was Marty Markowitz, uh, the borough president of Brooklyn at the time, standing on the Brooklyn Bridge um, ushering people over during a time of immense tragedy and being that champion for New York City and that champion for the city. We need more of that right now. That's a big part of what being borough president is all about. The second point on land use and zoning is something I am uniquely qualified to do as somebody who has not just served on a community board, but actually run one. So I have uh, presided over and handled issues, whether it's related to mandatory inclusionary housing, other zoning issues in my neighborhood on the Upper West Side. Uh, for the last 10 years that I've been on a board, the board and in a leadership position, uh, running one for, for three years. That's a critical, uh, important role that I really believe that I uh, have unique experience um, on the ground in neighborhoods to be able to do. And then the third position, um, which is you know the third piece of the job um, which is really running the community boards is also something I bring that is unique. Um, I ran one. Um, I placed community equity and inclusivity at the heart of everything I did during that time running the board. Uh, and you know, I look forward to talking a little bit more about it in the details about how I would bring in more members. Again, I'm, I think I'm the only candidate in the field who has really been advocating to make sure that those board positions are truly nonpartisan and truly neighborhood related. Um, they should not be political appointees. They should not be people who are people who agree with you all the time. Uh, I think one of my greatest strengths as, uh, as somebody who ran a civic organization and who's now working uh, full time for an international organization is that I, I work very well with people, even the people who don't agree with me on every issue. And it's really important, especially now during the pandemic and as we get out of it, to have the right type of executive leadership who can bring the right people together to solve the problems that we need uh, in this city. Let's let's stick with a couple of those things. So on, sure. on land use, on zoning, say a little bit more about your philosophy if you if you're going borough wide here, what would you how would you approach those powers and the you know considerations around changes to land use, around development, around zoning changes? How do you think about that? And what are you pledging to voters in terms of the perspective you'd bring? Sure, it's a great question. And it is one of the real statutory responsibilities of this job. Uh, on my website, elizabethcaputo.com, Caputo, Elizabeth you can actually see um, what the actual responsibilities of the borough president are. Uh, uh, related to zoning and ULERP, um, which for those of you who don't know, ULERP is the universal land use review process. As Manhattan grows, it is very clear that we need an increase in affordable units. There's no question about that. And the pandemic has only um, exacerbated the importance of that. Um, the statistics that I have show that 44% of all New York households are rent burdened. That means they pay at least and perhaps more than 30% of their income towards rent. Manhattan is a city of islands. My campaign is built on bridges. I wanna build bridges. But it's very clear, even in the borough of Manhattan, which is what I'm running for, we can't develop out anymore. We've got a, we've got a limited finite space here in Manhattan. So we have to figure out how we're going to develop, whether it's up or how we're going to make sure that we include, whether it's higher density construction, that we prioritize and make at the front and center the affordable housing crisis. Rezonings are things that I can talk about you know, in, in a little bit greater detail as you'd like. I believe that any rezoning that gets done here in Manhattan 
has to be conscientious towards the environmental, racial, and economic concerns of a neighborhood. I have said consistently throughout my campaign that every neighborhood has to do its part. So whether that's Soho and NoHo, or whether that's Uptown, or whether that's the Upper West Side, we need to make sure that every neighborhood does its part and that public transit is in mind in everything that we do. I'm a big believer in it. It's gonna be a cornerstone. It has been a cornerstone of my campaign. And we need to make sure that every development that gets built has accessible access to public transit as a top priority. So it sounds like um, you're in favor of the rezoning in Soho, NoHo that's, that's being considered? I am. And do you have any other areas of the borough that you think are good candidates for a, a rezoning and upzoning to add more housing density? Again, as, as I've said, and I, I believe in what people are talking about in my neighborhood on the, on the Upper West Side, uh, I believe that neighborhoods have to do their parts. Um, I have been supportive um, in what I've seen, um, for instance, at the South Street Seaport. Again, I think what's really required is the right type of leader who can work with both the people who are trying to build those developments and the people who want to make sure that the rezoning is done responsibly, responsibly with the right type of uh, sort of leadership and person who can speak to everyone. When you say um, ensuring public transit uh, you, you know, is available, what do you have in mind? Are we talking about adding any more subway stops in Manhattan or what are we, you know, are we talking about making sure there's better bus access? What do you have in mind there? We need to do everything. I mean, I am, I am very out there and supportive of the open streets plan. I think the pandemic, um, despite all of the consequences that have been terrible for so many people, has brought out the need to open up our streets in a more creative way. Uh, in, my, in my day job where I work uh, full time, I work on bridging and making transit more equitable um, to the broader world. And quite frankly, you know, cities around the world are doing it better than we are. Um, and we need to keep public transit a priority. Uh, I think there's a statistic in, uh, in one of the neighborhoods uh, and one of the teams I work with in London that um, trans transit use and public transport use is down. It's down, it's down everywhere. It's certainly down here. I think I saw that um, ridership is still down, you know, 75 or 80%. Uh, I believe that it is the great equalizer of Manhattan and we need to keep it a top priority. Uh, and to do that uh, means also looking at last mile solutions. It means looking at what's, you know, in many cities, um, the Paris mayor and Hidalgo has talked about 15 minute cities to make sure that every daily need is within a 15 minute walk, bike ride or public transit commute. And that reduces congestion and pollution and it improves quality of life in a given city. Those are things that I want to prioritize as borough president I also want to really focus on working with the federal government and bridging the relationships I have with our members of Congress who I've worked with over the years on prioritizing and, and the Biden administration on prioritizing the Second Avenue subway, which is again going to be a great transit equalizer for this city for generations to come. And so it sounds a little bit like you're, you're thinking about, uh, you know, continuing some of the reimagining of the streetscape that we've seen as, you know, somewhat of a necessity during the pandemic that sort of opened up more thinking on this, closing down some streets to car traffic, using more sidewalk and street space for restaurants and retail. Is that the direction that you want to, you know, accelerate things? Can you say a little bit more about what your vision is there? Do you think, um, you know, Manhattan needs to... Uh, lose a lot more of the, the on-street parking spaces to, you know, rethink some of that use? Do you think there needs to be more bus-only uh, busways? You know, how are you thinking about some of that? Sure. So on the parking spaces, I don't want to say let's park that for a, a second or two, but but I, I have a lot of thoughts on the, on the parking issues because as community board chair, I've dealt with it pretty much every day in the 10 years that I've been on the board and the, the three years that I was chair. Uh, in terms of the street tape, and the open streets. I do think this has um, made an incredible opportunity. I have worked really closely with the Hospitality Alliance, uh, Andrew Ridgey, who uh, is one of our board members on Community Board 7, uh, has been um, a great source of counsel on you know, how we're thinking about building back small businesses. The reality is that this city and its tax base, the, people, the reason people live in Manhattan, uh, live and work here, is because we have a thriving community of restaurants, of arts, of culture. 
we need to bring that back. We need to be, we need somebody who can be a champion um, for those industries to bring that back. And when we bring that back, it brings back the tax base and it brings back people who want to live here. That needs to be a top priority of anyone who becomes Manhattan Borough President. In terms of the, uh, the issues related to cars, um, I believe in open streets and I believe as much as we need to do to encourage public transit, micro mobility, equitable forms of transit, there are still tens of thousands of, uh, whether they're first responders or whether they are essential workers or whether they are people who work um, in Manhattan to deliver your groceries. They are people who rely on public transit. It needs to be 24 seven. We also need to make sure that any forms of mobility, um, new forms, whether it's you know, e-bikes or e-scooters, and I can talk more about that specifically because I was the only, um, I think the only person in this race who got three bike lanes put in, in in my neighborhood during the time that I was community board seven chair. Those are issues um, that not everyone has a credit card to put in to go to a city bike or to ride on a bike to do things. And we need to make sure we're making transit and transportation and micro mobility equitable to everybody. On the issues of cars and the issue of cars in our neighborhoods, I do believe that there is a middle class in this city. And I have lived in my neighborhood for 25 years. I talk to people who are the doormen, who are the people who are working here every day. They are not able to access transit depending on where they live because Manhattan, quite frankly, is a very expensive place to live. And they rely on a car to be able to get to work every day. So I think, again, one of the things that really needs to be addressed in the conversation on mobility is how we make sure that every class of people who lives, works in Manhattan is actually able to access a transport method in a way that is, again, safe, clean, and green. Um, we obviously wanna reduce cars on the streets, but we also need to make sure that the people who are working here in Manhattan have access to safe and affordable transit that again, you know, reduces the number of cars on the road, but you can't just eliminate them. Quickly Sorry. before we move on, do you, do you believe in a in a parking um, permit system for residents and you know people who work in certain neighborhoods get a registration sticker that they're the ones that are allowed to park in certain places? Do you like that idea or? I don't or think not? any resident who moves in here has a right to any part of Manhattan has a right to a parking space. I think they have a right to um, getting around this city in the most equitable way possible. In some cases, that means a parking spot. In other cases, and in most cases, it means getting on the subway and getting uh, one of the solutions I've proposed is, you know, uh, reduced when the city comes back, reduced fares for their Metro cards. Um, so they have an incentive to actually take the tra trains rather than uh, use their car. A couple of things you've mentioned that I want to come back to. Um, one is how reliant um, Manhattan is on restaurants, culture, arts, um, obviously, tourism uh, ground to a halt during the COVID crisis. Um, that, you know, there are some signs that that some of it might come back as this vaccine works its way around the the country and the world. Is there something related to arts, culture, tourism? You know, that you would try to spearhead as borough president to try to revive, um, you know, that whole sort of sector and and the the vibrancy of Manhattan. Sure, and, I, and I've already done it. I'm, I'm really excited to be supported by um, many people who represent, whether they're the Lincoln Center, um, arts and culture, the people who are part of the Philharmonic or the opera, workers who um, have made their claim to live here. They wanna stay in Manhattan um, and they haven't been able to uh, have a good quality of life. It's hard to, I, I, I gave an example of somebody who, uh, who plays the flute um, and, you know, you can't teach, um, be a flautist and teach flute lessons, you know, over Zoom. And so we need to figure out a way to bring that vibrant arts and culture back. And what that means is it's not just, it's those communities, it's those individuals, but it's also when you think about it, the people who travel in from around the world. Um, you know, I work full time at a global organization, the World Economic Forum. I've spent the past year working on something called Common Pass with, with a number of different people, with the Port Authority, with other local organizations to try to figure out how we safely and responsibly bring travel and tourism back to Manhattan. That is critical. And whoever is elected borough president 
needs to have that global vision in mind because that's a tax base. That means that the arts and culture comes back. That means people who come here will come here because they wanna see a Broadway show. They want to go to, um, you know, they wanna to go to Lincoln Center for something. And then more locally, the people who have children in the public schools. My mom was a um, public school educator. She taught at PS 166 for many years here. Um, I have talked and I am the only public school, um, I think champion in this group who has advocated for keeping the schools open and opening them. Without that, there are people who are going to leave. And the reason people stay in Manhattan is because they want a very vibrant arts, culture, um, city and places where you can get access by transit and walk around every day. Those are things that I care very deeply about and I will prioritize as we bring back our uh, economic uh, recovery. You mentioned obviously chairing the community board and, and uh, working with community boards across the borough if you're elected borough president. Uh, you mentioned getting bike lanes uh, installed in your community board. Talk about community boards and you know it sounds like a lot of the things you're saying is sort of uh, forward looking that you are, um, you know, you're not coming to this race with a philosophy of sort of more conservative trying to keep a lot of things in Manhattan the same that you, you know, are interested in uh, new ways of trying to think about transportation and street use and housing development and other things correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. So how do you sort of uh, think about working with community boards and ensuring that those boards are both representative of the larger communities and not barriers to progress. Sure, um, and just a word about my experience um, as chair of community board seven. You know, I was the first um, community board chair who not just got the bike lanes in, but also built the city's first truly inclusive playground, um, which is Bloomingdale Playground, and established the first um, public housing task force. Those were things that I was 100% and completely committed to that had never been done before on community board seven. Um, so you can, Pair that with sort of bringing city bike to the Upper West Side um, and bringing the bike lanes. But to me, those were the most important pieces because it brought true inclusivity and equity um, to my neighborhood. And that was something that was very needed. Before you yes. go further than answering, sure. can, can you tell us the, the public housing task force? Is yeah. there something is there something that that accomplished? Did it lead to anything that's noteworthy? Sure, it led to the playground and it it still has what it did. And I think this goes to your question about how uh, I would run community boards. Uh, I think a lot of what community boards have been um, run as, depending on who the council member is and who the elected official is, uh, has been done based on politics and metrics and numbers. That's really important. And I made sure every year that I was chair that our, our board membership reflected the diversity of the neighborhood. What's even more important is having people who are actually leaders within the board. And so that is something that absolutely needs to be done um, in our neighborhood. And again, the fact that it wasn't just bringing in more people from um, public housing onto my community board so I could check that box off, it was actually giving them a role with real responsibilities that um, and people who could be in leadership roles where they could stand up at a board meeting in front of a group of you know several hundred people at many times and talk about the work they were doing to promote things like the inclusive playground and other things. That to me is critically important and it's I think the only way that you learn that is by really being on the ground um, and again not just being on a board, but actually running one and being able to make those types of executive decisions. So I'm very proud of that. And, uh, and I think any number of people who s continue to serve on that task force um, will agree that it has been something that has been a, a benefit um, to our neighborhood. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of that. So in our last few minutes here, I wanna sure. try to hit a few things quickly. So unfortunately this will be a little bit more of sort of like a, a lightning round of questions, you know, sort of brief answers to get um, where you stand on a few a few things. Name name one community in Manhattan, one neighborhood, one one sector of the of the island that has a particular need. You think um, and what and what it is? Sure, it's, it's a it's a very good question. Um, I would say, um, to be honest with you, uh, it's probably um, in the northern part of the district. And I think that. Um, when I was chair of community board seven, our district went from 59th to 110th river to or park to park. So center park to Riverside park. I think there are a lot of issues that 
um, get ignored or don't get handled that are north of 96th Street. Uh, and I don't know if that's a failure of leadership from our current local elected officials, or if it's just that we need to be focused on Manhattan being one borough throughout every part of the neighborhood. And um, that is, you know, a place where there is high bridge. I was really excited to hear today about, you know, an Inwood, $5 million going towards um, public parks up there, whether it's Riverside Park. Um, and, and I've worked with Dan Gorodnik over the years as an advisory, advisory member of, uh, of um, Riverside Park, making sure that Riverside Park doesn't just stop at, you know, 96th Street. It actually goes up, you know, close to the GW Bridge. Um, those are issues that really need elevated and expanded as our city moves forward. And so I would really look north of sort of 96th Street, whether it's east to west, and make sure that we have that, that neighborhood um, really representing what is a very vibrant community uh, in Manhattan. All right, a few more quick things. Um, one, is there an issue, and just, just naming the issue, uh, is there an issue, a sort of topic that's really uh, important to you that, you know, may not be the borough president's, you know, set powers, but a, a sort of issue topic that you really make a signature issue that you would work on as borough president? Sure. Again, I think this plays to um, my 25 years of experience um, having worked here. And I think this borough needs to be a place that is not just for people um, who live here, but it's people who live here and work here. Uh, and it needs to be a place um, where we can provide opportunity to all. Um, okay. To me, one of the things I've worked on very closely is on technology issues. And I think uh, universal free Wi-Fi needs to be a top priority. We've uh -huh. seen it in, if, if I could just finish, the, the, yeah. um, the, the public schools in this city. And part of the reason I've been a champion for opening our schools is because there are 60,000 laptops sitting somewhere. The right type of leader needs to make sure that we have um, educational equity and we have technological equity across our city. The jail plan uh, to build, rebuild a jail in Lower Manhattan. Um, what would you? What's your stance on that? And, and is there anything you try to do as borough president to either make sure it happens or doesn't happen? Sure. So I, I do believe, like I said at the beginning um, of my remarks, that um, every neighborhood does have to do its part. Um, I believe in the closing of Rikers Island. Uh, that's been delayed for far too long. Um, I know that we need to end the legacy of that prison, but again, each borough needs to do it par its part, and we need to find smaller, smarter facilities that can support, most importantly, inmate rehabilitation and making sure, again, every neighborhood needs to do its part. But what does that mean for the the plan, the jail plan as as it stands now? You're you're for it or against it? I'm a, I'm supportive of Manhattan having um, a facility that can support inmate rehabilitation. All right, we're gonna to have to leave it there. Elizabeth Caputo is a Democrat running for Manhattan Borough President. Thank you for the time. Thanks so much for your time. You can go to elizabethcaputo.com. I'm grateful uh, for the time today and it's been great talking to all of you. Thanks so much. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in the June primaries and the fall general election. There's a lot on the line for all of us and the future of New York City. I hope this conversation and others are helpful to you. I'm Ben Max, see you next time.